Um, welcome, uh, welcome to Yale, and uh, we look forward to your, your comments on this interesting space in which you have done a lot of work. Thank you. Great. Th thanks, Bob. Uh, you're going to meet on your side so we don't get feedback. But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go through a batch of slides, and then I'll pause. Uh, I'll ask for questions, and, and you know, hopefully, hopefully you're still out there. Because right now, I'm sitting in my office talking to a blank screen uh, with no feedback. So uh, every once in a while, I'll just uh, turn over to you to make sure you're still there and, and things are working fine. OK. Um, I want to talk about uh, this notion of inclusive wealth. And in general, uh, uh, this is I've done a lot of work on ecosystem services and valuing ecosystem services and integrating ecology economics. But the inclusive wealth framework is, is an interesting one for thinking more about the dynamics of systems. And do we, uh, are we on a sustainable development uh, pathway or trajectory? Um, so let me launch in. Um, and as I said, I'm happy to have questions. Um, I'll try to pause uh, at sort of reasonable intervals um, so you can, uh, you can fire away. OK, so to me, the sustainable development question really is, can we or are we on a, a global socioecological system? Is that on a trajectory that we can maintain or enhance human well-being over the long term? OK, so I'm going to take a very anthropocentric view. Uh, so this is from uh, the viewpoint of humanity. Can we sustain human well-being? Now, you could modify this approach and say, you know, can we uh, maintain biodiversity or from other species' point of view? Um, clearly, if we don't maintain ecosystems and biodiversity, that has impacts on human well-being. So I'm going to be including a lot of what happens in nature through its impacts to how it affects people, so the, taking seriously the notion of ecosystem services. OK, so what I'm going to do here, just as Pavan uh, suggested, I want to discuss a framework, uh, and really the inclusive wealth framework, for thinking about whether we're moving in the right direction or the wrong direction if we, want, if we care about uh, sustainability. In other words, if we care about human well-being over the long term. Um, and at times, I want to get to a practical question. I won't necessarily have answers for this practical question. But you know, if, if I were a policymaker or a manager, would the actions that I'm taking, would that increase or decrease the probability of sustainable development? Fundamentally, I want metrics um, and yardsticks that are going to be able to answer that question and provide this sort of practical advice. Um, now, answering that practical question requires that we really have ways to measure impacts of alternatives on current and future human well-being. And that can be complicated by the following, you know, if you think about the following logic. Suppose that I'm doing an action which has an impact on an ecosystem, right? So I, I drain a wetland to grow crops. Um, what are all of the consequent changes in the ecosystem that then occur because of that change? How does that affect the set of ecosystem services that are provided? Um, and how does this, you know, over the longer term, how does that uh, affect the set of, of services that are provided? Um, and so, you know, and, and what are the values of those? And what is the impact on human well-being? So the chain here in answering this practical question really takes us from human actions through impacts to ecological science or hydrology or other natural sciences back, mapping back to ecosystem services, which are saying mapping back to human well-being, um, and sort of trying to figure out, you know, are we better or worse off? So it's, from my view, it's really an integrated question here for both natural and social science to be able to get at this question of, are we improving or, or moving further away from a sustainable uh, development trajectory? OK. so. I want to talk first very briefly about some operational metrics for sustainable development. So what should uh, a, a metric, operational metric have? What are properties that it should have? Um, then I'm going to talk more at length about the inclusive wealth uh, framework as a metric for sustainable development. Um, I know you have at least briefly talked about the uh, work by Arrow and Partha Dasgupta and 
uh, Carl Jorn Mailer and others on efforts to measure inclusive wealth, and I'll touch on that. Um, because as it will be obvious in my comments, I think the really hard part here is actually making things operational to answer those practical questions. So I think the empirics here is much harder than the theory. But I'm going to lay out the theory first, then we'll get to the empirics. And then I'll talk about some other approaches, not um, at the national level, not on, along the lines of inclusive wealth, uh, but sort of can we, can we make some progress, say, at local and regional scales um, in measuring ecosystem services and trying to incorporate those or fold those into um, a set of economic accounts and do a better job. Okay, so that's, uh, that's where I'm headed. Um, I thought it was very interesting in putting up all of the, so Pavan, I've, I've, I've stolen your slide from the, the ones that you sent me. And the thing that I, I really liked about this was, you know, we really want to have an integrated measure, economic, social, environmental. And the one that's in the middle of all of those is, is one that you've labeled genuine savings. Uh, that's really what I'm calling inclusive wealth, right? So you can call genuine wealth, inclusive wealth, um, and savings and investment. It's, it's all about have we provided enough savings and investment so that the value of the capital, the, the really inclusive or genuine value of the capital um, is going up through time. So we're trying to integrate across economic, social, and environmental in order to do that. So that's why I'm really focusing on this inclusive wealth framework. Okay, let me uh, pause here for a moment. Um, I'm going to go into desirable properties for a, a metric, but let me pause and see if there are any questions at the moment. And also, just, just please turn it on. Your microphone. Yes. Um, me... Stephen, you probably need to stop sharing it so that we can see you and vice versa. What's that? You need to stop sharing the slide for a moment so that we can see you and vice versa. Okay. Uh, all right, stop sharing. Done. I can't see you, though. And you probably can't see me now. I can see you. Can you see us? It's unfair. What do you, what do you hang up and then call you right back? OK, is it doing that or should you just go ahead with the uh, sharing and get to the talk? Uh, let, me, let me try and hang up and I'll call you right back because I think okay. that'll fix the video problem. OK. Okay. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, here we go. We can see you now. Okay, see, I am a real person. I'm not just a disembodied voice. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, were there any questions you want uh, answered now, or should we go back to sharing the screen and, and uh, go back to not seeing each other? What do, I, do I go over there next? No, no, I think you can hear you. Just speak up very loud. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I like the, um, the sort of ethical view behind your um, approach, but where's your proof about this assertion that um, this anthropocentric approach will enhance uh, biodiversity? Uh, no. could, couldn't we actually lose a hell of a lot of biodiversity and have no impact on well-being at all, and in fact possibly even enhance it? Okay. I, I'm not actually asserting that we necessarily, if we just focus on human well-being, we'll necessarily bring along all the biodiversity with us. Um, so that's why I put on the kind of proviso that um, you know you, you might want to append this and say that your objective is not purely or simply uh, human well-being over the longer term, but you might want additional kind of sideboards or maybe additional uh, main objectives. Um, I'm, I, I will be agnostic on that. Um, I will say one thing, however, which is that we know that um, if you, you know, 
If we do damage life support systems, so if we do fundamental changes to ecosystems in ways that no longer provide a set of ecosystem services, that we, in fact, are going to damage human well-being. Um, so, and I know you've done enough work on the UK and TEAB and other things that you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, no, there is a there is a question. I mean, sometimes we might do things that people say, "Well, I, I you know, I want to have more consumption goods, and if that means poorer water quality and fewer species, um, if the people, you know, if people are willing to make that trade off, then there is no guarantee." I, I mean, I, I entirely agree. Um, I don't know if you're hearing this. Um, <coughs> can you hear this? Hold on. Okay, we're going. Uh, hello. Okay. I, I was just going to res respond and just say, yeah, I entirely agree. Uh, the pr I, I, I was being sort of intentionally provocative. Uh, provocative, yes. And I suppose the real problem is that we're just a long way off having the natural science knowledge to actually know uh, when we hit that point uh, of... Um, uh, reducing biodiversity in a way that actually uh, affects uh, the life support systems underpinning human well-being. So we just don't kind of know what to do, really. <coughs> Which is, I think more ecosystem processes and functions more directly rather than focus on biodiversity and you know what's the link between biodiversity and ecosystem function. Um, so, you know, one can care about species directly, um, not necessarily for the things that they provide in terms of ecosystem services, um, other than sort of their existence value or cultural value. Um, there's a huge amount written in ecology about the link between biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, a, a lot of it is um, inconclusive. Um, so, basically, I want to go directly at this question of what are ecosystem services and what, what is it that, you know, how do we take that link between what ecosystems, the ecosystem functions and then human well-being, and that link is ecosystem services. And whether one wants to go through biodiversity or not, um, I, you know, I think there's a much more direct link, which is through services. Cool. Okay, thanks. That's, that's good. Are there, are there questions? Okay, should I go on? Do I need to share screen again, I guess? Yes, please. Yes, just say yes. You'll have to say yes. Yes. Okay. Careful. Are you seeing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. yeah, it works. Okay. Yeah. All right. On we go. I will get my screen going here. There we go. Okay. Um, do you want me, I guess I should try to X you guys out so that it actually is a full screen. Okay, see you in a bit. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk very briefly about, uh, so what do we mean, what do we want to have in a metric of sustainable development? And, and that leads into the discussion of inclusive wealth. Um, so desirable properties. If, if this is about non-declining human well-being, then really what we're talking about is comparing the future with the present. So the re first and fundamental requirement we have to have is that the metric has to be able to address future well-being, not just a current snapshot of where we are. Most approaches, however, if you look at most indices, uh, I think you've probably talked about the Human Development Index um, or Ecological Footprint or a, uh, a lot of measures that are out there, and I know that uh, Pavan talked about a number of indices. Most of the indices are about the current state. Um, that's fine, it's good, especially if you look at past trends, but it doesn't tell you where we're headed. And um, the kinds of measures that I'm really interested in are where are we headed? Is this forward-looking, not merely backward-looking? The second one is that it has to be operational. In other words, we actually could measure this with existing or potentially collectible data. Um, and those, to me, are the two essential things that we have to have in order to really talk about and measure sustainable development. Forward-looking and have it operational. It would also be very nice if it were theoretically coherent and complete. Um, the problem, uh, and, and, and when I get to inclusive wealth, we'll talk about um, that it does a very good job, I think, on this sort of third criteria in this theoretical coherence and completeness. Um, it is forward-looking. The real question is whether it's operational or not. 
Um, and so I'll get into that when I get to kind of more of the practical questions and measurement questions. Okay, um, for the most part, I'm going to be talking about sort of social aggregates, sort of in, uh, you know, if, you, if you thought about the average person or um, in total, how is, you know, all of society's aggregate social wealth. Um, but before I do that, I want to make just a brief aside on, on equity issues, because clearly, if we're talking about aggregate measures, that doesn't tell us anything about how particular segments of society are doing. Um, so are we, you know, are the poor being helped or hurt? I mean, we can have aggregates going up, but the poor being worse off. And so a question that you might want to ask is, do we need to have disaggregated measures and report on the progress of individuals or groups rather than just this aggregate? Um, and in fact, if, if you take like the Brundtland Commission definition of sustainable development, you know, meeting the needs of the current generation without um, uh, sacrificing or, or you know, allowing the next generation actually to meet uh, their needs. One way of reading that is that it's all segments of society have to be able to meet their needs. You know, if, if particular parts of society are being left behind, then we really have not met sustainable development. Um, there are various approaches that one could do this. Most of them involve disaggregating, um, so that you actually are looking at uh, different groups, not just the kind of sum total. And you could look at uh, you know the percentage of the population that was meeting. Uh, some basic threshold, you know, say a $2 a day threshold or some uh, measure of the Human Development Index. You could, if you really wanted to, uh, focus a lot on equity, focus on the, the poorest, so a Rawlsian approach, look at the welfare of the worst off members of society. Um, most of the discussion that I uh, am going to talk about, one could modify the objective uh, to take account of equity concerns, and I actually think it's very important to do so. But uh, for purposes of getting through the talk and clarity, I'm, I'm just going to be talking about the aggregate. And that's where uh, the literature is right now. But, uh, but the equity point is, is very, uh, I think, is, is, is a vitally important question. Okay, so um, I now want to talk about um, inclusive wealth as this metric of sustainable development. Um, so I'm going to plunge ahead and go through uh, a bit of the theory, and then when I get to the end of this section, I'll, I'll pause again and, and sort of take stock and see if there are questions, and then we'll go into more of the empirical side. Okay, so the advantage of inclusive wealth, as I've indicated, is that it, it provides a coherent and cohesive view, uh, sort of unified coherent framework to talk about sustainable development. It is forward-looking. I mean, the wealth component, it's really focused on assets and asset value. Asset values, at least in theory, are capturing the future flow of benefits that those assets create. So that's why this is a, a potentially uh, a useful approach for um, looking at sustainable development. Um, the problem here is that really to do this, at the moment, it suffers from impossible data demands. So it's more of an ideal than a practical guide to sustainable development. And at the end of the talk, I'll come back and try to you know, say, how, how do we bridge this, and how do we make some practical steps now, even as we're working towards this more ideal um, approach? Okay, so it's not the full answer to the practical question, but I think it provides some guidance as to what kinds of information we need and what we should be, uh, what, how we should be collecting information and what we should be doing. Okay, so in inclusive wealth, um, I don't know the background of the people in the class, whether you're economists or not economists. I suspect there's a mix of backgrounds. Um, the inclusive wealth framework is fundamentally an economics framework. Um, if you know growth theory or you've had macroeconomics um, from uh, at any time and you've gone through growth theory or economic dynamics, Inclusive wealth is, is essentially, um, that's essentially what it is. Um, it is an extension in a practical sense from what's in most uh, economic textbooks in the sense that it focuses on really being inclusive wealth. In other words, let's try to incorporate all forms of, of assets, including natural capital. So not just focused on manufactured capital or manufactured capital and human capital, but let's incorporate natural capital as well. Okay, um, so in order to do this, I'm going to take a very quick and highly selective tour through economic theory. 
Um, and there's really two components that I need, and I know you've already talked about discounting. Uh, we've had a session on that, so I'm not going to belabor that, but we do need to spend uh, at least a moment on um, well-being and what do we mean by um, sort of non-declining well-being through time, because that's the essence of what the sustainable development definition was about. Okay, so if we talk about well-being, uh, measure of well-being, economists use the shorthand utility. Um, an individual utility, it's a subjective view, it's their view of satisfaction. Do I like one thing more than another, or am I better off in state A or state B? So it's not the economist imposing their view on utility, it's what the individual defines as their own well-being. Okay, so we can think about uh, sort of the state of the world or a social state. So anything out in the world that can affect uh, well-being of an individual. So we can talk about, so how well off are they are given this sort of social state X? And that maps from the state of the world to how well off they are in that state of the world. So that can be anything. It could be, you know, how polluted is the world, how much do they get to consume, uh, so forth. The main point about utility functions is that they allow us to rank states of the world. So if they are better off in state X than Y, you know, we just write that their utility is higher or that they prefer state X to state Y. Okay, utility functions are quite broad. All I've really said is that this is a way, in a way, it, it's a shorthand for capturing the preferences uh, for the person. That, that basically they, they can rank when they're better off and worse off. Okay, and as I said, it, it's anything can go into a utility function. So it could be existence of biodiversity. It could be the aesthetic beauty of their neighborhood. It could be a food consumption, whether they have a flat screen television, on and on and on. Okay, whether society is equitable, they care about that, and so on. Okay, so the, the real point here, the real work has to be done in terms of dynamics, right? So we need to think about how is welfare changing through time, and is this person, if we ask them tomorrow, are they going to say, yep, I feel more satisfied or I'm better off uh, in the future, you know, tomorrow than they are, than they would have answered today. Um, so we need to think about non-declining utility through time, and we want to evaluate that trajectory of utility through time. So as you've already talked about discounting, the standard approach here is to try to aggregate up this welfare, well-being, through time, and to collapse it back to a single value called the present value. Right? So we're going to take the whole stream of benefits through time, say how well off are you or how likely are you to be you know, this degree of well-offness in the future um, and how do we rank that relative to how well you're well off you are today. Okay, so if I now define things explicitly in terms of time, so we have the state of the world at time t and the utility of the individual at that time given its state, we talk about the discount rate or discount factor um, so we can then define the present value of the flow of utility through time as this V function, right? So this is the, the value of the stream of utility through time. Okay, and non-declining human well-being, at least for this individual, is that this value, this present value, so if I evaluated it today, and I evaluated this tomorrow, that your V function evaluated tomorrow is at least as well, is at least as good as what it is today. Okay, so the nice thing about this is that it provides a very clear, simple definition of what it means to be on a sustainable development trajectory. Okay, so, but what does it really mean? Um, it doesn't always mean that um, it, well, okay, what it means is that future prospects are always non-declining. So the stream of future welfare is at least as well off as if, in, if you define it in the future as if you defined it today. But that doesn't mean that utility at any given instant is always non-declining. And this give you a simple example of this. So suppose that I'm, my, my utility meter, whatever that is, uh, registers two today, one next year, and then three forever afterwards. And suppose I have a discount uh, factor of, of 0.9, then if I sum up my present value of utility across all of these years, if I do that today, I get a score of 2.72. If I start this tomorrow, so next time period, so you see I've dropped the 2, 
the one becomes the first time period, and then I discount the threes on out into the future. If I sum that up, my present value is 2.8. So even though there was a dip in my utility, it went from two down to one and then up to three, I'm still having this, this low value of utility is non-declining through time. And that's what, uh, that's what this criterion is about. Okay, so my offset of decline utility in this, you know, into the period two is offset by speeding up all of those higher utilities um, off into the further future. Okay, um, the other thing that this criterion does not necessarily imply is that uh, even though you satisfy it for some period of time, it may not be satisfied for all periods of time. So, um, again, I'll give you an example of this. So suppose that I, I rapidly ramp up my utility, so it goes from one up to five, up to 10, and then back down to five. If I evaluate this today, I get a score of roughly 50. If I evaluate it tomorrow, I get a score of uh, 54.5. I evaluated two periods hence when the 10 is present value, or you know the current period. I go up to 55, but then after that it goes down. I would not claim that this is in fact a sustainable development path because utility would be declining at some point in the future. So all of the period, the V3 on off, are less than V2, and in fact, less than any of the V0, V1, or V2. So I hope this is clear, sort of what the mechanics of this V function is doing, or the present value of the flows of utility, because that's really at the heart of this um, uh, inclusive wealth framework. OK, the other thing uh, is not only are we aggregating across time periods, so the flow of benefits through time, but we're aggregating typically up to the societal level from the individual level. Um, so typically that means we've got to aggregate up across many individuals and many groups. Um, there's this uh, fiction called the social welfare function, uh, which is some function of the utilities of all of the individuals who make up society. Um, I'm not going to go into, you know, a lot of people have have written about what are the properties of the social welfare function and does it exist? And Arrow has written about, uh, famously about, it doesn't exist under some very um, basic um, kinds of conditions. All I'm going to insist on here is that um, this function, the social welfare function, be increasing in its arguments. So if I make one person better off, then, and nobody else worse off, that the social welfare function increases. Other than that, I'm, I'm not going to really pin down what this aggregate social welfare function really is about. OK, let me get back to the main thread of the story, which is the sustainable uh, development and how inclusive wealth um, is a measure of, of sustainable development. OK, the problem here is utility meters or functions, we can't measure this directly, right? So we don't know really. You know, I can't go out and directly measure V as the present value of utility because I, I, I can't measure individuals' utilities, much less aggregate them up across people. So instead of going that approach of looking at the flow benefits of utility through time, let's switch to using this wealth measure, which is a stock variable. So we'll look at the assets, which are stocks, rather than the flows of utility. Um, and so this, you know, what we're looking at then is the, like the, the capital assets. So it may be natural capital or manufactured capital. We'll measure those at uh, a period of time. We're not going to be looking at flows of services. Um, so, but in principle, as I said, the capital assets, uh, they can, or the value of those capital assets is really the present value of the flow of the goods and services that that capital asset generates. Okay, so that's the link between what I just talked about and the next couple of slides that come up. Okay, so just forms of capital that we're going to be concerned about. Well, clearly manufactured capital, plant and equipment, infrastructure that contribute to production and consumption and human well-being. But we're also considering natural capital, so ecosystem states or processes, biological stocks, biodiversity. Uh, physical natural resources, so oil and mineral stocks, all of these um, contribute to human well-being, or potentially contribute to human well-being. Human capital, the stock of knowledge and experience, uh, the learning, uh, the 
kind of collective learning of, of society. And then um, a, another form of capital, which is a little bit elusive and, and hard to uh, measure, probably even harder to measure than natural capital, the set of institutions and relationships um, that contribute to production. Um, I'm going to probably, for the most of the rest of the talk, really focus on kind of the human, manufactured, and natural, but, but clearly social capital is also um, vitally important. I mean, just look at some countries that um, are, are resource rich, um, even human capital rich, but are poor in terms of how well off they are in social and economic terms, largely because they don't have a set of functional institutions. Okay. To get at the question of sustainable development, we need to talk about savings and investment. Okay, so how much do we consume now versus how much are we saving um, for, uh, for future well-being? Um, okay, I think you all know about savings and investment decisions in principle. Um, I just want to state that what I mean by savings and investment and what I mean by consumption is really broadly interpreted here. So, uh, consumption might be looking at a pretty view or, uh, you know, the aesthetics of a, of a situation. But I certainly could invest in that. I can, I can make sure that I've maintained vistas so that future generations will also have the benefit of, of looking at these beautiful views. Okay, so saving and investment, again, broadly interpreted as anything that affects the evolution of these capital stocks, be it natural capital, social, uh, manufacture, or human. Okay, so we can talk about this vector of um, goods and services, these consumption goods, if you will, uh, the utility that we get from consumption, and the vector of capital stocks, again, including all four um, varieties or anything that, that we think of as a stock or an asset that affects human well-being. We're going to talk about the evolution of those capital stocks. So they change through time that that, that will affect um, not only the stocks themselves, but basically the, you know, our well-being through time. So what can we consume, again, broadly speaking, through time? So if we talk about the change in the capital stock, formally that's just the derivative of the capital stock with respect to time. Okay? And that's going to be a function of our savings and investment decision, which is a function of how much we consume versus how much we save. And it also can be a function of the current capital stock. So we might have depreciation of current capital stock. Okay, so we can formally write down the optimal consumption or optimal savings and investment choice is the following. We want to maximize the flow of utility through time, and it's going to be a function of the capital that's available at that time. And so we have to take this, you know, the evolution of the capital stock, which I just talked about. So if we solve out for kind of the optimal consumption, we get the optimal capital stock and we plug in that values, we'll get this score for V. We'll tell, we'll basically say what's the value, the present value of the flow of utility through time. Right? So I'm back to that V function. But note, and I'm, I'm actually not going to go through uh, the derivation of this. I'm, I'd be happy to do so, but, but I'm sure you don't want me to do so right now anyway. But, um, uh, you know, we can go through kind of, you know, what, how this unfolds and what the necessary conditions are and sufficient conditions and so forth. But the bottom line of this is that when we solve out for this V, you know, we solve that problem, we're going to get a value which is a, which is a function of how much, the function of the vector of capital assets that we have. Okay, so the more capital assets that we have in general that will allow greater flow of utility through time and give us a higher present value score through this V. Okay? So, Again, if we want to come back to sustainable development, we want V to be non-declining. Just some simple math, if we take that uh, optimization problem where I get the V as a function of capital stock, we take the derivative through time, I get these two terms. First is how does V change as an individual component of capital changes, this KJ, and then how is that capital stock evolving through time? And because this is inclusive wealth, I have to sum this up over all the capital stocks. Okay, so J1 to N. Now, the nice part about this is it breaks this into like two manageable chunks. What do I need to know? I need to know, first of all, what the value of any given capital stock 
is. So this is called the shadow price for capital, you know, for capital asset J. How, if I change that capital stock, how that affects the present value of well-being, this V function, that's the, that's the shadow price of, of the capital asset. Now, in some cases, we actually observe prices. And so it's not a shadow price, it's actually an actual price, right? But in other cases, especially with natural capital, we'll have to infer what that value is, and that's why the term shadow price is there. The second thing we need to know about is the net investment of capital. Okay, so how is capital changing through time? So this DK, DT, and that's the net investment in capital asset J. So if we knew the shadow price, you know, the value of a unit of capital, we know how the capital is changing, this I, then what we can do is we can sum this all up and we get this term that we, so that the change in inclusive wealth, the change in genuine savings, if you want to say it, that's equal to DB DT, right? This is our, our sustainable development uh, criterion. So if we want to have sustainable development, really what we're requiring is genuine savings to be positive, i.e. inclusive wealth to be non-declining through time. Okay, so this is the, the theory part. Um, they say it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's an application of, of economic dynamics. Um, and as, a, as theory, it's, it's a really nice piece of theory. It tells us kind of what we should be focused on. We should be focused on you know, how valuable various uh, components of capital are and how are those changing through time. Um, Okay, so I think I've just restated that on this slide. Let me just uh, go ahead and make sure that I've sort of said all of this. Uh, yeah, so here, here's the summary that uh, the change in inclusive wealth is really the change in um, uh, how, how human well-being is changing through time, that trajectory. And so these are one and the, one and the same. Okay, um, let me pause here because next I'm going to go into... Um, uh, a lot of the empirics, uh, you know, how practical is this, what can we measure um, and not measure. So um, I will go back to sharing the screen and uh, see if there is any, uh, any questions that you have. Um, we cannot see you, Steve, so maybe okay. we'll try to hang up. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I can see you. Okay, any questions or are you ready to plunge on to the empirical part? I think we might have come at least this distance. Maybe yeah. shower. So I was just wondering, um, I'm not quite trying to form this question, but I'm wondering if what the sort of impact on the utility, sort of aggregation of the utility is of a lot of the sort of behavioral economics findings where people have trouble. If, if your utility measure is hedonic, is based on hedonic experience, and people have trouble predicting what's going to be a good uh, you know, what will be beneficial for them in the future versus now? I mean, it's just sort of the, the problem of predicting over time. It seems like with things that are even more intangible than necessarily, say, like buying groceries when you're hungry or buying too many groceries when you're hungry, but things like preserving an ecosystem, which is even more outside of a person, sort of like a really direct personal experience, how does that play into these utility measures? Or, or are you sort of just, I guess, could, I'm wondering if you can just unpack the individual utility assumptions here a little bit, given that you know, part of what the sustainable pathways is assuming is people will value sort of provision of public goods and value sort of um, ecosystem services, which may actually, as you, as you put in your V, your sequence of Vs, take a few time periods to realize, even maybe time periods beyond sort of the normal effects of, of you know, poor forecasting on, of individuals. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good question. Um, so I'll try to unpack a little bit here. So, you know, there's, when I was a graduate student, uh, 
it was sort of before the behavioral economics revolution, and, and I always stuck, frankly, to the supply side of the economy because I didn't trust the, uh, the, the demand side of the economy and all this stuff about utility functions. And it's like, I don't know anybody who behaves like the classical uh, economic theory utility function. Um, so I, I really, I, I'm so glad that the behavioral economics um, world has come in and we actually talk about real people rather than um, idealized uh, maximizers of, of, of something. Um, but okay, so I, I can take your question a lot of different ways. And let me, let me start with kind of the most uh, basic, which is um, I, I think really the way to understand this is, is, is if, if we thought about this as, um, you know, what are important constituents of human well-being? So we all know that we need enough food to eat, and we need uh, places to live, and um, you know, health is an important component. What I take is that this is really, at a fundamental level, trying to ensure that the constituents of a good life are being provided both now and into the future. Um, so, you know, do I spend my money on, um, on a, you know, going to a movie or flat screen television? I don't think we're ever going to get to that level of, um, it, you know, at, at this aggregate level. I, I, I don't think we're, I don't think it's well suited to answering those kinds of questions. What I do think it's well suited to is, is asking about, um, you know, are we providing the fundamental life support? And so are we, are we likely to be able to produce enough food for people um, in 2050, given that we've got, we're going to have 9 to 10 billion people? And, and are we, um, you know, other measures of, of like, uh, of health in the future? Um, are resources going to be adequate? Are, is the education system going to be up to, um, you know, up to or better than what we have now? So I think there's a, a way of thinking about this is about the kind of basic components of human well-being and trying to translate from what do we know about the trends in some fairly fundamental assets, how that, you know, what's the translation from providing education and health to human well-being? Um, so I, I think we're at that, you know, kind of mostly at that scale. Th there is an interesting component that you raise about behavioral economics, which is the following. Um, suppose that, and I, and I, I really do think that uh, we are largely creatures of our experience. So what we care about, you know, in the next time period is heavily um, uh, conditioned on what we've experienced up until now. Um, so, you know, most of you probably would not consider living through a Minnesota winter. Uh, I've experienced them and I've lived through them and I don't think they're so bad. So, um, you know, I think, I think our future preferences in a way are, are, are action, our actions in the past have fundamentally conditioned our current preferences and our current and past actions will condition our future preferences. You know, I actually think that's that. Um, there's an interesting, um, perhaps. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think, you know, people get used to what they have, um, and so in a way, it makes things more sustainable. If, if you've never known anything else than what you currently, you know, have, it may have been very different or may have been better in the past, um, but that's not your frame of reference, and so you know, it may be that. Uh, people in the future with diminished biodiversity uh, or diminished ecosystem function, as long as they have food to eat and a place to stay, they they might say, oh, "Okay, well, you know, we're happy with this." Um, I mean, you know, we certainly have much less in the way of natural habitat now than people had in 1700. Yet, I doubt very many of us right now would change what you know our position for for what people had in 1700. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's some really interesting questions here about what do we mean by aggregating up present and future well-being and, um, you know, if, if, if future well-being is really conditioned on current choices, um, I think there's some interesting puzzles that need to be worked out in terms of this inclusive wealth framework or in more in generally thinking about um, sustainable development issues. Okay. So I think we can go back to. That's fine. That's good. Any other questions? Uh, back to slides. Uh, no, 
I think we're good. I think we can go back to the presentation now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think I need to skip ahead now. Um, okay, so uh, I want to shift gears and now get practical. We've talked about theory at least at the 50,000 foot level. Um, the question is, can we measure changes in capital assets or shadow values? Um, okay, so measurement challenge. Can we put the inclusive in inclusive wealth? Can we measure changes in the relevant stocks? Can we measure the relevant shadow prices? Um, I'm going to go through this actually very quickly because I want to make sure I get to the end of the talk, which is uh, where I, I get to other measures besides um, kind of the arrow at all type measure of inclusive wealth. Okay. What capital stock should be included? Well, this is inclusive wealth. So anything that affects uh, well-being should be included. So all forms of capital. Um, manufactured capital. Well, you know, this is a typical form of capital considered by economists. This is most closely related to things which are in um, uh, at least capital accounts uh, today. So we have measures at least of some forms of capital. You know, do we measure depreciation accurately? Do we actually have all forms of manufacturing? I mean, there's a number of caveats here, but for the most part, we have better measures of manufactured capital than we are for other measures of capital. What about natural capital? So by natural capital, I'm going to include uh, land, uh, land resources, natural resources so in the way of mineral or energy, timber, uh, fish stocks, so forth, environmental quality, um, but also ecosystem processes that, you know, if we, if we change an ecosystem structure or function that, that then led to changes in these more proximate uh, forms of natural capital like environmental quality. So, Fundamentally, we have to keep track of kind of the infrastructure of ecosystems just as we would keep track of the infrastructure uh, of manufactured uh, capital on the human side. Okay, unfortunately, natural capital, we can, you know, we can certainly track certain aspects of natural capital. So mineral resources, energy resources, timber, um, some forms of environmental quality, so greenhouse gas concentrations. but. Um, even here, of course, what we want is not the flow of minerals and energy. We really want how is the stock of these uh, resources changing. So I don't want to know about current oil production as much as I want to know about uh, reserves of oil. And there's great uncertainty about reserves, even for things like oil, which are um, heavily studied. Um, uh, fish stocks. You know, we have some stock assessments. There are questions about, you know, how accurate and so forth. But so, so we can measure some stocks uh, with uncertainty, but we can measure some stocks of, of natural capital. Um, ecological processes, some types of environmental quality, the resilience of systems. So if we, if we are changing systems in perhaps subtle ways that might lead to, in the future, fundamental shifts in how those ecosystems function. We would try to measure that and capture that. I think that's something right now that we are woefully inadequate um, to be able to do. So there's a lack of systematic data collection. There's also, frankly, a lack of, uh, and kind of Ian alluded to it very early on when he said, you know, what's our natural science base of understanding? And is it up to the task? And in some, for some of these things, it's, it's clearly um, not up to the task at the moment. Okay, so uh, going on, human capital, so we're talking about education, experience. Uh, you know, we can at least measure how many hours you spent in the classroom, whether that actually measures how much you know is, uh, is a harder thing, and experience is also hard to measure. Uh, health capital actually turns out to be, if you've read the Arrow uh, article or looked at that, the 2010 version, their health capital measures uh, are hugely important and really drive, um, they're much more quantitatively important than other forms of capital. So the changes that they look at in terms of inclusive wealth are, are really driven by health capital considerations. How should we treat social capital or institutions? There are some measures of good governance. Um, can we predict in the future how much good governance there, is, there will be? I think 
uh, the answer to there is, is pretty fundamentally no. I mean, who predicted the Arab Spring uh, prior to the beginning of this year? Um, how do we think about trust relationships among people and so on? So there's a, there's a, a lot in social capital I think is very difficult um, to measure. Okay, so in summary, there's many forms of capital, some of which can be measured, some of which can be measured, but maybe only imprecisely. In some, it's going to be very difficult to get any kind of consistent data to measure uh, them at all. Okay, turning to the second component, uh, shadow values. The ideal world uh, of economic textbooks is that we have complete and competitive markets, full information, no externalities or public goods, in which case all capital stocks would have market prices and market prices would actually fully reflect the value, the contribution of that capital stock to human well-being. Of course, we live far from a perfect world um, and so market prices, uh, you know, well in general, here, you know, here's a statement, market prices, if, if, if you accurately price capital stock that should represent the value of the capital stock in terms of the present value of the flow benefits created by that asset. In the real world, we have incomplete markets for most natural capital, for social capital, even for human capital. Um, we don't have market prices for these things. Uh, even for prices that we do have, of course, there are imperfections. So we have monopoly or we have imperfect information or externalities. So the prices are going to have a distorted signal of the relative value. Um, certainly those people who do environmental economics uh, know this well. And people who have done TEEB or other things, I mean, this is, this is the classic problem. Um, so, you know, I could go out there and look at the market price of coal, but that market price of coal does not reflect the contribution of coal to greenhouse gas emissions or mercury emissions or air pollution or water pollution or mountaintop mining. The list goes on. So in order to correct the problem, we really have to know how does coal burning change the stock, those environmental uh, natural capital elements, so it contributes to greenhouse gases. Well, okay, what's the change in the greenhouse gases? We can probably do that. What's the value of the change in the stock of greenhouse gas, uh, you know, uh, carbon in the atmosphere? In order to do that, we'd have to have a shadow value on or social value of carbon. Uh, in order to be able to answer that question. Okay, um, let me skip this slide in the interest of time. It was uh, just talking about examples of, of market distortions and the fact that, that, that you have to worry about prices coming out of those. But uh, as I say, in the interest of time, let's, uh, let's go on. Um, actually, this is where I used to live in Oregon. And you know, so some people always ask, well, can we really value all of these intangibles and aesthetics and uh, you know, ecosystem services or environmental quality. So, you know, I always pause uh, to try to gain a little humility. You know, what, what would the value of this be worth? What would I be willing to give up in order to preserve this? These are tough questions, as, as the, you know, the question in the last break uh, alluded to. Okay, one thing that I do want to mention is that most of the work that is done in environmental economics in terms of non-market valuation is that we're typically measuring values under current conditions, right? What we really want here in terms of the shadow values of these capital assets is to understand the contribution of the stock to present and future well-being. So we really want to have a dynamic view to non-market valuation or in general to these shadow prices, not just looking at what do people or how do people value it today. Okay, so, um, I want to, the other thing that I want to at least make sure that I mention here is that the value of the capital stocks is treatment of uncertainty. Um, and this is crucial because, of course, I've been talking about the future, um, what's the present value of the flow of services through time, um, future conditions are uncertain. So how do we treat all of this? Well, in principle, one would want to do sort of a decision tree or, you know, a, a analysis where you specified all the future potential conditions, the probabilities of those conditions, um, estimate the values under each of those potential future states, and find the expected value, or you know, if you wanted to take a more risk-averse approach, you could uh, you know, weight it by, uh, by, by some uh, risk notion, but basically you know, um, find the expected utility uh, through time uh, weighted by the probabilities. In practice, of course, 
you know, think about something like climate change. We just don't know what's going to happen off into the future. So it's going to be very difficult uh, to you know, specify all of the conditions or the probabilities or the values of, of what those happen in future state. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to back off of uh, a little bit on this sort of valuation and really think carefully about uh, what potentially could happen in the future, uh, what are our potential risks, how well off or bad off would we be under those, uh, under those conditions. Um, I'm going to, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through this. There's in the slides, which I can share with you or make sure Pavan has, um, the questions of, of doing this with climate change and social cost of carbon. It would be the shadow value of a unit of carbon in the atmosphere or in the ground somewhere. Um, this is a really hard problem. There's a lot of things. And folks at Yale uh, have contributed to this. So certainly, uh, you know, Bill Nordhaus and uh, Rob Mendelson uh, have talked a lot about this. Um, so go talk to them. Uh, I'd be happy to field questions on it, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll move on. So where are we in terms of these measurement issues? So we're currently very far from having accurate or complete measures of all capital stocks. We're very far from having measures of the shadow values. We certainly can do partial analyses. And the Arrow et al. paper um, has done some. Um, and uh, you know, we can kind of see where they are on this. But um, we're, we're far from uh, complete, uh, complete notions or complete ability to measure this uh, theory of inclusive wealth. Um, so let me pause here now and uh, uh, again take some uh, questions. And then I'll, I'll hopefully have just a bit of time to plunge in on the last stuff on sort of other measuring ecosystems. Okay, any questions? Okay, are you there? I can't see you anymore until you can see me. Press that view um, file, the, the camera button. This one, the second one, right, yeah. Okay, you are. Any questions or should we plunge on? Back to productivity. Um, Steven? What's that? If we go back to um, looking at the the fact, that that, the fact that a dynamic view is needed, and one of the things that one needs to keep track of is factor productivity. And yes. How much does a unit of human capital or fiscal capital generate over time? How efficient does it get? Um, is this, is this uh, something generally that is being attended to in, the, in these practical examples? OK, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, the two that I'm going to get to, which is Arrow's approach and uh, and then our approach on ecosystem services. Um, we don't do a good, uh, speaking for me, we don't do a good job in the ecosystem services world in talking about um, changes in total factor productivity, technology changes. Uh, that's something that I hope we can improve on. Arrow et al. actually do a reasonably good job of taking account of total factor productivity and incorporating that into the analysis. Um, so, you know, when, when they go through their adjustments, uh, they start with kind of, you know, sort of the basic what change in inclusive wealth, but then they adjust this by population to get the capita, and then they also adjust this by uh, increases in total factor productivity to get sort of the, what I call real per capita change in inclusive wealth. Um, so I'd say that they uh, attempt to, to incorporate changes in productivity. Most of the ecosystem services world um, is at more basic issues and does not do a good job of, of incorporating uh, changes in total factor productivity. Okay, back to the slides. Yeah, let's go back to the slides. Okay. 
All right. Um, okay, so um, I think you've talked about the arrow at all paper. There's a working paper that they've done um, really trying to measure inclusive wealth. This is an extension of the paper uh, in 2004, Are We Consuming Too Much? Um, Pavan's already talked about this, so hopefully I can go through this fairly quickly. Um, I do want to just mention the following, though. So their measures of natural capital include energy and mineral resources, timber, uh, timber resources, and carbon. That's it. Okay, so, um, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but uh, from my perspective, it's, all, it's a very partial step. Um, so there's no ecological processes, there's no notions of resilience or, you know, how robust the systems are, and there's very few other ecosystem services. So we're not talking about air pollution or air quality, water quality, um, aesthetics, um, hunting, fishing. I mean, you know, it's energy, it's minerals, uh, and it's timber and carbon. Um, other than carbon, all of these actually are traded commodities. So it's uh, it's nice to look at the you know the prices. Uh, we can you know, shadow values are just the market uh, prices. Although again, one would want to worry about the fact that particularly for energy resources, those are really tied to changes. You know, they, they fundamentally impact on the environment. So you really want to uh, take account of their environmental impacts. Um, they do that for carbon, but not for other measures. Um, this is probably too small for you to read. In fact, it's too small for me to read unless I put on my glasses here. And I'm right on top of the screen. But this was um, just to note kind of what was included in their, uh, in their measures of natural capital. So you can see, or hopefully you can see, it's oil, natural gas. So we've got the energy side. Um, they have various minerals, bauxite, copper, iron, gold, lead, and so forth. And then they have timber. Um, and there's a, a, a value in here for land, but it's not changing through time. So that's not going to affect anything on their inclusive wealth measures. Okay, so uh, the point here, so I just put this up for the U.S. and for China. What's interesting is, of course, oil and natural gas are uh, resources that are uh, exhaustible, and therefore, as you use them up, uh, those values are going to go down. Timber is a renewable resource and, in fact, has increased. The timber resources have increased in both the U.S. and in China. And the value of those, at least in the U.S., is more than offset the decline in value uh, from uh, the minerals and from uh, oil and natural gas. Okay, so now here's where we get to pulling together the estimates of natural capital, human capital, um, uh, manufactured capital, which they're calling re reproducible capital here. Uh, so looking at, and, and also the, the changes in carbon emissions, and so they're getting to what is overall the change in the capital stock in the U.S. and in China uh, over the time period 1995 to 2000. Okay, so this is, I, I, I'm not going through kind of what they included in human capital and manufactured capital, but uh, it's uh, perhaps more comprehensive than in natural capital, which was not very comprehensive, but it's still an incomplete list. Um, okay, so Pavan, this is really, uh, you know, your question a moment ago, how, how, how well do we do with actually thinking about uh, total factor of productivity growth, uh, so we get more outputs from inputs through time, through better technology and, and uh, better ways of doing things. Um, so when we factor in, so the left-hand column, the far left-hand column is just the growth, you know, kind of the, the raw, comprehensive, you know, raw, comprehensive or inclusive wealth uh, growth rate. So how are these assets, the value of these assets changing through time? We're going to modify that by population growth so we can get a per capita, which is column three. We're going to further modify that by total factor productivity. So we're going to add that up. Uh, to get to column five. And then what's really interesting, and I think you've probably looked at this uh, uh, in the sessions previously, so comparing the per capita comprehensive wealth growth rate, accounting for TFP growth, with the per capita GDP growth rate. In every case, uh, what's interesting is that this uh, comprehensive wealth growth rate is smaller than the per capita GDP growth rate. So. You know, there's some, GDP is not doing a, a full job of capturing um, the, the measures of depletion of various assets. 
Um, however, th th there is a pretty high correlation if you look at it between the per capita GDP growth and the, T and the um, uh, inclusive wealth growth rate. Those countries which are high in one are also high in the other. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this. This was basically the point of this was just to tell you that health capital really mattered. Uh, it kind of dwarfed the other things, and in fact, the natural capital changes were, were fairly small. Okay, I think this exercise is extremely informative, um, but it's informative not only sort of for what it tells us, but also what we cannot do. So there's huge data gaps. It requires many assumptions about uh, the accuracy of data. And uh, so, you know, would I think that this is the final word or even close to the final word on an answer to whether we're achieving a sustainable development trajectory? I would say no. There's a lot of things which are missing, and there's a lot of things which I think would take a lot more further study before I had great confidence in them. So, you know, in summary, there's sort of this stark contrast between the elegance of the theory and the limited ability that we have to measure capital stocks and changes in capital stocks and the, and the shadow values. Um, I think it's informative to, uh, there, there's a quote that I, I, I really liked from a book by Stiglitz and Sen and Fatuzzi on mismeasuring our lives or basically looking at uh, how well does GDP do and what should we be doing instead of GDP in order to get an accurate metric or measure um, of, of changes in well-being. And basically what this quote, I won't read it because you can read it hopefully for yourselves, that you know, basically what, what they're saying is that uh, you know, can, can, can we do this? Or is this sort of a bridge too far? Uh, this trying to summarize everything into uh, one number for sustainability, what GDP has played a role for in kind of summarizing economic performance. Um, and what they go on to say is it really is overly ambitious that um, at the present we really can't, while it's great uh, in theory, and, and don't get me wrong, I really appreciate the efforts um, that they have done, and I think it has increased our understanding. But to think that we're going to get a practical measure of inclusive wealth anytime in the near future, I, I think, is, is, is not right. Um, and maybe we ought to be thinking about augmenting our, the things that we can measure through uh, kind of economic accounts. So take that expanded set of accounts that Arrow et al. show, but then also separately track um, important, measure, important physical biological measures of how our ecosystems changing, um, how is that likely to impact on provision of ecosystem services that are important through time. Um, so we don't come up with just one measure, but we're going to have um, several measures and look at the trends in those measures in order to be able to say something a little bit more uh, comprehensive about uh, our, our trajectory and whether we're on a sustainable development trajectory or not. Okay, so um, uh, I hope I'm, I'm not abusing things by just going for a few more minutes um, and let me uh, just tell you a little bit about some of the work we've done. I think you had uh, talked with Gretchen uh, daily before um, about the Natural Capital Project. Um, and so uh, some of the work that we've done is, is really trying to take up this sort of more pragmatic approach that Stiglitz et al. think about, can we come up with sets of physical indicators as well as sets that we can, measures that we can plug right into kind of measures of, of economic uh, sustainability or, you know, the economic accounts. Okay, so we're going to look at measures of ecosystem services and how those change through time. Um, again, this is work with the Natural Capital Project, which is a partnership between uh, Stanford, Minnesota, the Nature Conservancy, and WWF. Um, in particular, we use, uh, this is freely available, the INVEST software, integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs. I want to talk about just one paper in particular, so modeling multiple ecosystem services at landscape scales. And this is a paper that was in Frontiers of Ecology and Environment in a special issue on ecosystem services in 2009. Um, and very briefly, what we did here in this paper was we had, we, we looked at alternative scenarios for how the future might unfold in the Willamette Basin. And we actually had from this group, the Willamette Partnership, 
a set of maps which were scenarios of land use and land cover for the Willamette Basin for every decade from 1990 to 2050. And they had these three different scenarios, a kind of business as usual one, a development oriented one, and a conservation oriented one. We used INVEST uh, along with spatially explicit biophysical and economic data in order to predict how under each of these scenarios a set of ecosystem services would change through time. Um, this is a, a map of the Willamette Basin in Oregon, uh, western part of Oregon. Um, these are just the maps for 1990, the initial kind of starting point, um, and then how these evolved through time. So there's a map actually for every decade, 2000, 2010, and so forth, up to 2050, um, and under these different scenarios. So for every time period beyond 1990, uh, for every decade, we actually had a map for each of the three scenarios. We then used INVEST to score, um, given those land use land covers, how well would we do for this variety of ecosystem services? You can see the list of services that we track um, in this model. If we could do the model over again today, we'd actually have an expanded set of um, services uh, that we could track, as well as species conservation. And this gives you the, the results. Uh, so under the three scenarios, for each of the given decades, from 1990 up to 2050, how well did we do for each of these various metrics? So the market value metric is actually the value of agricultural production, timber production, and housing values, which are easily, you know, we combine those into a single um, measure, which is kind of the, the ones that are, have market values and can be combined in dollar terms. The other ones, at least on this chart, we left in, in biophysical units, so the amount of carbon sequestered, how well did species do, so this is a, uh, the biodiversity is actually a proxy for uh, amount of habitat and, and how well did we maintain species given how much habitat there was, uh, flood control, soil erosion, and uh, water quality is phosphorus. You'll note that the conservation scenario does well on five out of six. Unfortunately, it does not do well in terms of market value. So if you ask landowners which of these scenarios would they prefer, um, you know, the others are sort of public goods. The landowners themselves would do better under plan, trend, or development. But, you know, suppose we actually could internalize some of these or get payments for some of these public goods or internalize the externalities, however you want to say it. So the, the left-hand side on the circles, this is the the trade-off between the market, the value of marketed goods um, on the horizontal axis and how well did we do in terms of biodiversity conservation on the vertical axis. And this is just accounting for agriculture, timber, and housing values. The triangles on the right also add in the value of carbon sequestration. So suppose that we could take a, a calculation for social cost of carbon. In this paper, if I remember correctly, it was on the order of $43 a ton uh, C. Uh, if we added those values of carbon in, now what do we get is no longer this sort of trade-off, but in fact the conservation scenario does better in terms of both the present value, if we incorporated that uh, ecosystem service of carbon sequestration along with agriculture, timber, and rural residential housing. Um, and so we now get this sort of, it does better both in terms of net present value as well as um, species. And, and that points out the, you know, I. I even if we don't have inclusive wealth measures that are complete and fully accurate, I still think we can do exercises like this and inform decision makers that say, you know, you're really better off, you know, we would be better off under this conservation scenario than under development or plan trend if we really took account of the full value of ecosystem services. And here I'm not even taking account of the full values, but, you know, if we added in water quality um, or flood control, then the conservation scenario, since it did better on those, would, be, would have an even, even larger lead than the kind of narrow lead it has in terms of net present value over the development and plan trend scenarios. Okay, so, you know, kind of in summary on this, the, the, the failure to incorporate these oftentimes leads us to poor decisions. So exercises like what Ian did in the UK um, and what TEEB has done and what the Millennium Assist, uh, Ecosystem Assessment has done and now ongoing work um, natural capital project and others, you know, can we do a better job? It's not can we do a perfect job, because we certainly can't, but can we do a better job from where we are now? And I think the answer there is clearly yes. I mean, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, we, you know, we, we basically don't do hardly anything on this front now, 
Um, and so, you know, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, let's put it that way. And even without a complete accounting, uh, we can certainly improve upon decision making by incorporating what we know um, or predictions about uh, likely impacts on, um, on services and natural capital. And so um, I, think, um, I think this is just sort of a, a, a summary slide. And um, I think uh, I can probably, um, I, I just want to get to the, this last one, which is we don't have a grand unifying measure of sustainable development. You know, uh, physics also doesn't have a grand unifying theory, but physicists still keep on their work and they still make progress. And I think we can make a lot of progress. In fact, I, I think we can make huge progress um, because we're starting in a, you know, in a way, we're starting from such a poor base that, that um, you know, really fundamental um, advances can be made um, relatively quickly. Um, we do have enough measures and metrics, you know, through efforts like what Pavan led in TEAB and what Ian is leading and, and others, I think we can make a lot of progress. And I certainly wouldn't wait around for the perfect approach. You know, let's, 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 let's be practical and let's get on with uh, the business here and, and trying to improve um, on sort of where we are now to incorporate um, ecosystem services, natural capital, and to really, you know, try to fulfill this notion of um, the getting as close or closer to this notion of inclusive wealth. Okay, so with that, I probably abused my time, and let me stop, and uh, I'll stop sharing the slides and uh, see if there are any questions. <laughs>